the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Hi, everyone. It's me again, Lacey Bonar Hall, and I'm here today with another episode in the mini series on rumor and gossip at the Tudor Court. Today, we'll be traveling back in time to the reigns of Richard III and Henry VII as we explore one of the biggest mysteries of the medieval and Tudor period the disappearance of the princes in the tower. The princes in the tower were Edward V and Richard, Duke of York, the sons of King Edward IV, who died unexpectedly in the year 1483. Instead of the crown going to Edward's son, his brother, Richard, assumed the throne as King Richard III. Richard's nephews were locked away in the Tower of London, never to be seen again after the summer of 1483. The fate of the princes is still a hot topic today, and it's one of history's greatest mysteries. And it's one I couldn't pass up exploring for this series. So today I'm joined by three expert historians who specialize in the period and who give some really fascinating insights into the key players who are often blamed for the disappearance of Edward IV's sons, Richard III, Henry VII, and Margaret Beaufort. Our first guest is Matthew Lewis, an expert on all things Richard III. Matt is one of the world's foremost experts on Richard and his rule, and he's even written a book on the princes entitled The Survival of the Princes in the Tower, where he puts forward some really interesting theories on the fate of the young boys. Our second guest is Nathan Amin, who specializes in Henry VII and his reign. Nathan explores the rule of the first Tudor monarch in his Henry VII and the Tudor pretenders, and he has some really exciting ideas about what may have happened to the princes. And last but not least, our third guest is Nicola Tallis, author of the book Uncrowned Queen, an engaging biography on Margaret Beaufort, mother to Henry VII and one of the most powerful women to live through the period known as the Wars of the Roses. Join us for the first part of this two-part episode as these experts explore the disappearance of the princes and the possibilities for their fate. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for for coming on the show. I'm so excited to be able to sort of meet the three of you virtually uh, and be able to talk about what's one of my personal favorite uh, historical topics, the princes in the tower. So thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so like I said, this is really exciting. We are very lucky to be joined by three historians who each specialize in a historical figure who's often at the forefront of accusations of guilt when it comes to the mysterious disappearance of the princes in the tower. So Margaret Beaufort, Henry the seventh, and Richard III, of course. So to kick things off, I thought we would just go expert by expert to ask about the rumors surrounding the guilt of these three figures. And then we'll go ahead and circle back and ask each of you your thoughts on the possibility of their guilt. So I have a few set questions for each of you, but I would love for this to be a conversation. So please feel free to weigh in on anything that you'd like, but do keep in mind that since this is a podcast, maybe try to keep from speaking uh, over one another, just so the listeners at home can can be aware um, of who's talking. I know that can be kind of difficult, especially when it's um, a topic that is as interesting as this one and something, like I said, uh, that the three of you really specialize in. But so we're going to jump right in. Our first question is for you, Nicola. So it seems like some popular portrayals of Margaret Beaufort have led people to believe that she's always been scheming for her son, Henry, to take the throne, which has led some people to say that she's guilty of wrongdoing in the cases of the princes in the tower. So was this a rumor that circulated at all at the time? Or is this something that's just like a modern day type of invention? Yeah, exactly the latter. Um, It wasn't something that circulated in Margaret's day. In fact, I wouldn't even say in many respects that it's a modern thing. I would say it's a thing just of the past few years. So when um, I was researching and writing my book, I had the privilege of being able to speak to Dr. Michael Jones, who is probably, well, no, definitely actually, sorry, the authority on Margaret Beaufort and has written the most thorough study of her life. 
And he wrote his book, I think in about 1992, it was published, something like that. And the whole idea of Margaret as playing a role in the disappearance of the princes, it just wasn't a thing then at all. So it's something that's very much come about as a result of popular culture in recent years. And unfortunately for Margaret, it's something that has really stuck with her and that she just can't quite shake off, unfortunately. But it is something, without trying to spoil what I'll say later, it is something that I'm working on to try and change. And I know that there are others who who feel the same. Okay, that's that's good to know because like you said, unfortunately it does, it seems like it's one of those things that really has staying power that it's, especially uh, on social media, which I know all of you are pretty active on social media, it's not unusual to see people laying a lot of blame uh, against yeah. Margaret Beaufort when talking about the princes mm-hmm. in the tower, even though there really isn't, like you said, any of that uh, historical evidence or charges laid against her uh, to back any of that up. And even so, I recorded an episode for Matt's podcast recently, which was, um, you know, uploaded recently. Yeah, it was good. I listened to it. It's a really, really good podcast episode. I would, I would tell anyone uh, to listen to it. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. But we even have one lady, right, Matt, saying, oh, but she didn't she kill the princes? And it's like, oh, goodness sake. And, but it does just go to show the, I mean, like her or loather, and I know that there are people who don't like her, but like her or loather, there, it is really annoying that there is this kind of stigma against her and it's just it just does go to show actually the impact that popular culture does have on shaping people's viewpoints and unfortunately i don't know are we going to see that change probably not but i do feel that it's quite quite unfair in, in margaret's case she wasn't perfect but you know i think that a popular culture has a lot to answer for where she's concerned. Sure. Yeah. She's, I mean, like, like all historical figures, especially the two that, that we're going to be talking about next, she's a complicated person, right? It's important to remember that these, you know, they're real people. Um, it's, you're going to be hard pressed to find someone who was like a, a perfect person who didn't really have any faults or any drawbacks to their character. But like you said, it's, with Margaret, I think it is, it's a case of that so many people are interested in the princes in the tower, which is awesome. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those historical mysteries that has been fascinating people literally for centuries, right? Since the the late uh, 15th century, people have been asking these kinds of questions, but recently we have been seeing uh, a lot of talk, I think unfairly um, against Margaret, but okay, Matt, hop, jump, jump right in. (laughs) Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a nervous laugh. You know what's coming. Um, now, I would only say that I absolutely agree with Nicola. The, this is a, a modern phenomenon. It seems to come with an incredible amount of conviction that it's definitely true. Those who espouse this idea are utterly convinced. And I think partly in an effort to exonerate Richard III, they're just aiming at another target to to fill that gap and point the finger at somebody else. But I would also say that Margaret Beaufort was up to her neck in all sorts of things in 1483. She's convicted of treason in Parliament in February 1484. She's attainted for treason, which theoretically could have led to her execution, but her life is spared and she's put into the custody of her husband, Thomas Stanley. So there is a sense that Margaret is up to an awful lot in the contemporary record, but nobody ever points the finger at her anywhere about the princes in the tower. And you'd think that would be a pretty easy claim for Richard to put against her, which is part of my argument about Richard murdering the princes, that there's lots of other people he could have pointed the finger at if he wanted to blame them, and he never did. Um, So, yeah, I I was just wanting to agree with Nicola that Margaret being accused of murdering the princes is... Sorry, was that shocked that I'm agreeing with you, Nicola? No, sorry, my cat just slammed at the door and I was just going, oh, sorry. <laughs> but no, I, I, I am quite shocked. <laughs> it shocked the cat. <laughs> yeah, the sh- it shocked the cat, so. <laughs> well, well, I agree with you. So she, she was up to her neck in all sorts of things, but no contemporary accuses her of murdering the princes in the tower. What I will also add to that is I did have an interesting discussion once with a with an elderly lady in the Richard III Society at one of my speaking gigs. 
And she came up and she she queried me, why are people now saying that Margaret Beaufort killed the princess? Which took me back a bit because, you know, my my experience with a lot of Ricardians um, in the modern era via social media does tend to be that Margaret Beaufort is, you know, the, the, the devil herself uh, and almost certainly the, the butcher of children. So, so this lady's question took me back a bit and, and I asked, what does she mean? And she mentioned that she'd been a member of the Richard Third Society for 50 years and it was only in the last 10 years that this name had started to be put forward. You know, in the past, we've, she said, we've had Richard III, Henry VII, Buckingham, James Terrell, and, you know, all the old classics. But where had Margaret come from? And, you know, I, I have to say that I've only been around studying this for this 10 years, and, you know, I don't have any prior experience of Margaret suddenly appearing on the landscape. And we have to almost certainly level the responsibility for that at Philippa Gregory and social media. Um, you know, you, you you hang around any of these Facebook groups at the moment, I'm going to say oh, it's probably leaning in very heavily to Margaret Beaufort being the the, the, the murderess of the Princess of the Tower on, um, on you know, two to Facebook, Tricardian Facebook groups. Um, it's... It's essentially a fact now. <laughs> it's, it's become a fact. And I will, you know, I will support the, the Richard side in this. This is as much of a fact now as perhaps Richard has been for the last four or five hundred years. Um, mm. I, as I always say, to to unmalign somebody, you can't necessarily malign another. It doesn't really work that way. This tit for tat history. But there we go. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna add that. As much as I, I kind of really want to disagree with Matt, and we do disagree on certain things <laughs> because it's fun. But um, genuinely, I think he's got a really good point to say that um, you know Margaret was up to her neck in all sorts of other things, and so it's not right. Equally, even though I don't think she played any part in the mystery of the princes in the tower, it isn't right to say, okay, well. Yeah, she's she's perfect. She's great. She's this. She's that. Because you know, she was very much in 1483. She was one of the key players in the events, and she was very capable of committing treason. Clearly, so um, I think that it is is important to look at it from you know an objective standpoint and say, yeah, you know, she did have this conspiratorial streak in her for sure. I would just add that the, I mean, the the only element in which I would concede that I think Margaret Beaufort may have been involved in what happened to the Princess in the Tower is that the Cronin Chronicle reports that as part of those October 1483 rebellions against Richard III that a rumour begins to be spread that the princes have been done away with and murdered. I think that that rumour is based on absolutely no knowledge, but I can see Margaret Beaufort or at least her faction being behind the spreading of that rumour to blacken Richard's name, to to draw support away from him, to convince Elizabeth Woodville in Sanctuary to join her cause. You know, we know it's her doctor that goes to visit Elizabeth Woodville in Sanctuary and sets up this arrangement where Henry Tudor will marry Elizabeth of York, Edward IV's daughter. So I can see Margaret, perhaps, and this is me, you know, guessing, I can see her perhaps starting or being involved in spreading this rumour that the princes have been done away with to destabilise Richard's government. But that doesn't mean that she did it or had anything to do with it or knew what had happened to the princes. It would have just been a convenient story for her to use if that is the case. But that's just me guessing. Or Richard could have just killed them. Just putting it out there. He could, but so could Margaret. You know, the fact that nobody accused her at the time doesn't mean that she didn't do it. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of possibilities, uh, but I do, I like thinking, and, and obviously, you know, none of this can be um, proven without a shadow of a doubt, unless we end up getting some news sources, which I'm always hopeful that someone's going to stumble on something uh, that that is kind of like that smoking gun. But obviously, you know, we don't have that yet or else we wouldn't still be talking about this 500 years later. But I do think it's interesting, like you point out, Matt, to say, you know, we we have this statement in a chronicle we don't know where it came from they don't cite their sources but who might you know have been responsible for that nugget of information and why 
might that nugget of information even been put out there in the first place? Because it is, you know, it's important. I think we we look back on the princes in the tower and especially just Richard III uh, as an individual. We look back with hindsight and a lot is clouded um, by people like Shakespeare, right, who have given us these popular portrayals um, of people in the past. And then now, like you said, Nathan, Philippa Gregory, who's kind of clouding the character of Margaret herself. And I think it's, you know, it can be easy to make people uh, look like they're 100% bad or sometimes 100% good. And it's just, it's important to remember, you know, that that's not the case. And even some of this information that we might have from these chronicles, it doesn't necessarily mean that that was 100% the historical reality, that there it might have been someone uh, feeding information to someone else for their own purposes. Someone who gets a lot of pushback on social media um, is Henry VII, right? He's not entirely um, popular. He can often be overshadowed by his son, who I don't know if, if Henry VIII is more popular um, as an individual, but he's definitely someone who's talked about more. Maybe his personality um, isn't liked as much, but he's someone who gets a lot more face time. But Nathan, you're you're kind of uh, working to correct that, right? You're our resident expert on Henry VII. So I want to move on to him for a second because he's someone who also is often um, pointed at as being someone who might have been responsible for the disappearance of the princes. So now we have to assume that this would have kind of been a delicate subject for him, especially after he ended up marrying Elizabeth of York, because she, of course, is the older sister of the princes and the tower. But do we know, did anyone in the 15th or 16th centuries talk about maybe Henry VII having been involved at all in the disappearance of the princes? Uh, to give you my, the long answer, no. <laughs> I now, love that. <laughs> now, the thing is, people will say um, there's no record, there's no known accusation level to Henry the Seventh because why would there be he was the victor and the victor writes the history etc but you know that that statement is not never is not necessarily accurate in most cases you know if that statement was true that Henry the Seventh had written this perfect history of his reign and his time we wouldn't have so much negative portrayals of him Today, you know, we wouldn't have such characterizations of him as being a miser. We wouldn't, we wouldn't even know the names Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel and all these other rebellions against him. Um, we would have the image of this perfect, wonderful angel from heaven, as one chronicler called him at the time. You know, that would be our sole idea of Henry. So I think it is telling that there isn't any known record of him having killed the princes in the tower, not because he did it and he covered it up and he got his propagandists to to portray him as, as you know, blameless because, well, he didn't do it and there's no real evidence, there's no real credibility, I, I believe, in him having um, done away with the princes in the first place. Hence, there's no, you know, there's no mud that's stuck to his name at, at this time. Um, I might be wrong, you know, I by no means have I read every source or uncovered every document. I've, you know, I'm still on the on the start of this journey of trying to find out more, really. So, you know, somebody out there might correct me and pull out this little document that's been hidden away for 500 years in the in in the Richard the Third archive somewhere, waiting waiting to bring down my one man crusade. Um, <laughs> But, but no, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there, there was no contemporary accusations levelled at Henry, and I would I would add, wh why would there be? I think part of the issue with, with thinking about Henry the Seventh as being involved is that that requires the princes to be alive in 1485, because obviously Henry is out of the country until August 1485, and I think for many people that even that is a stretch too far. Most people don't think they were alive still at that point which means that Henry is absolutely in the clear. So I'm not one of those people. Obviously, I have my own wacky ideas about the princes in the tower. Um, but I'm, I mean, I, to counter that, you know, I would also say that after 1485, Henry is pretty much controlling the flow of information. He controls what is known about the pretenders and all of that kind of thing. And so 
I mean, we we know, for example, so the the whole bigamy story about Edward the Fourth that makes Edward the Fifth illegitimate also makes Elizabeth of York illegitimate. Henry has to re-legitimise Elizabeth so that he can marry her. We know in 1483 that there is evidence of that bigamy. Whether it's true or not, I you know we, we can't assess that because that evidence hasn't survived. Because Henry would have had a vested interest in destroying it and getting rid of it because he wouldn't want bits of paper floating around that suggested that his wife was illegitimate. So Henry would have been controlling the flow of information to some extent. Yes, you know his reign isn't painted as all glory and sunshine and, and brightness, as Nathan says. But he was in control of information. So if the boys were alive in 1485 and something happened to them after that, we probably shouldn't expect Henry to have written that down somewhere. But I just to jump in quickly and say that my personal feeling is that Henry's own reaction to the pretenders, so Lambert Simnel and to Perkin Warbeck, suggests that actually he didn't know what had happened to the princes and, you know, because he was trying to do all he could to find out about the identities of these two imposters. And I think the fact that, um, you know, that he did spend so much time and, and energy on that suggests that, yeah, actually he he didn't know what had happened. So therefore he can't have been involved. Uh, that's just my I, I, I also think that this idea that, you know, Henry as a master of propaganda, you know, this Tudor machinery that's completely controlling all the flow of information has been completely overstated. And um, there certainly was a concerted attempt to control the information of the day, as there was under the Yorkists, as there has been under every single king, queen and government to the modern day. There certainly was an element of that, but too much slips through the cracks in history. I mean, we all sit here and we all work going through uh, the little archives, the little financial records. Something would have slipped out. I mean, that's why I still come down to this idea that the boys died under the reign of Richard III, because nothing else comes out after 1483, 1484, no records, no small payments, nothing survives. I know that buys into my theory that they were killed during that time, but also supports Matt's theory that they went on to survive and hence they were spirited away. I think if they got through to 1485 in the reign of Henry VII, somebody somewhere would find some form of little... Uh, insignificant financial records, some chamber account and so on. Again, if if Henry had really had that tighter grip on this control of information, we wouldn't have a Richard III society today because no one would find anything plausibly decent to say about him. Um, the fact we do shows that, um, you know, these guys try to control the story put out there. But again, just like today's media, there's too much too much counter in that for anyone to have a complete control of that. Um, but there we go. Who knows? Who knows what will turn up? I would, only, I would only add to that that no one has found that smoking gun and that piece of paper yet. No. I mean, people haven't particularly pursued the idea of the boys surviving beyond 1485. Most historians laugh at me when I say it. You know, it, it absolutely... Yeah, I know. Hands up, everyone who's laughed at me <laughs> saying this. Yeah, absolutely. People don't take it seriously. Therefore, it isn't an avenue that has been properly resourced and, and explored in the way that lots of other aspects of medieval history have been. Because yeah. often a side note in a book on the princes in the tower, they might have survived, but obviously they didn't. So okay. I just wonder whether this hasn't been explored fully enough yet. And we're just waiting for that to come. Yeah. Because because weirdos like me sit on podcasts like this and talk about the idea that they might have survived. <laughs> No, I think you're I think you're making a really good point there, Matt. And I think, do you know what? I desperately, desperately want Matt to be right because I like him and I I've got so much respect for his work. But I just can't. I just I can't get myself there. Um, but I do think you're making a really valid point that it has been under researched and that perhaps we do need to turn our attention a bit more to post 1485 and what what evidence we've got one way or the other um but on the other hand i would say that maybe there's a reason for that and maybe <laughs> maybe it's just because it's all pointing back to 1483 i think that's um it's it's a good thing to think about you know i mean how fun would it be if 
we found some evidence that suggested that maybe they did survive or that maybe one of the pretenders was in fact one of the princes in the tower. Uh, so Matt, keep looking. I think you do a great job. Um, even if, you know, if people might re be resistant to that idea, I think it's, it's good that there's someone out there like you who is spending the time actually, you know, trying to think about this possibility because it is a possibility that has been just kind of shrugged off, um, is being not likely, uh, if not impossible to, you know, to a lot of people. Um, so I, I would say, you know, to anyone who's interested in that, to get their hands on your work and to, you know, maybe be a little bit more open-minded thinking about possibilities that don't just, uh, blame Richard, which is what I want to talk about next. Um, so Matt, I do, I want to come to you with this one because obviously Richard is, that's the person who I, I would say nine times out of 10. Um, but Nathan, like you said earlier, I don't know if that's even the case uh, now in the age of social media. I know I did a poll um, on Twitter asking people who they thought was responsible for the disappearance of the princes in the tower. And I expected more people to say Richard the third, um, but they didn't. It was, you know, a lot of people said Buckingham. Um, a lot of people said, uh, Margaret, you know, or Henry the seventh, but I think traditionally, at least, uh, the person who has taken the most blame is Richard the third. So Matt, I know you, you obviously have some really interesting theories on what might have happened to the princes, which I do want to hear about, um, those theories, if you'd like to share those in a bit, but right now I want to be talking about the big man himself. So can you give us any insight into what people were saying at the time. So was there any discussion about Richard being responsible um, for the disappearance of his nephews? Or is this again, something that just came out further into Henry the seventh's reign um, or you know, further into the, the Tudor period? Is this something that was talked about at all, um, especially when Richard himself was still king? I think, unsurprisingly, it is something that is talked about while Richard is king because these two boys are there and then nobody knows where they are. And obviously the rumour mill is going to go crazy. I think what's interesting is the number of sources who will only report, you know, people have said that maybe something might have happened to these boys and they don't often actually name Richard. Some will say, you know, perhaps the king was behind it. So... We've got kind of, you could probably count on one hand the number of sources from within England, within Richard's reign, that, that really talk about the princes in the tower and probably less than that name Richard as potentially doing it. All of the, the early certainty that Richard murdered the princes in the tower really originates on the continent. So we get uh, in January 1484, a man called Guillaume de Rochefort stands up in front of the French parliament and tells them all that Richard III had murdered his nephews and usurped the throne of England. Pretty clear, you know, no doubt there definitely happened. But I think with a lot of these things, context is important. So the very short version of this is that France are in their own minority crisis. So the problem that England had faced in 1483, France are neck deep in it in 1484 and 1485. 1485 to 1487, they hit a period of civil war known as the Mad War, which is a fight over the regency of Charles VIII. And I think what I think what the French are saying there is, crikey, we don't want to be like those horrible English over there, do we? Look, they murder children and then you get a monster on the throne. So I think Richard is a political lesson, a, a tool that's being used by the French for their own aims. And I think also the French had, just before Edward IV died, the French had kind of been making efforts to reignite the Hundred Years' War. They were on the verge of invading England. And I think Richard III is a very different prospect on the throne of England who frightens them more than Edward IV did, and certainly when they're in a minority crisis is more worrying. So I think lots of that very early certainty that Richard definitely murdered the princes really comes on the continent, which is obviously where Henry VII is, so probably they're the stories he's hearing and the people around him are hearing that Richard has murdered the princes in the Tower. But I just say that that doesn't make it true. That isn't real evidence. People in France are unlikely to have known what had really happened to the princes in the tower, I would suggest. Um, and then, of course, we get this kind of growing body of, of people accusing Richard after 
Bosworth. So lots of the, I mean, within a year of Bosworth, we've got a Spanish ambassador, Diego de Valera, writing back to Spain to say, you know, your majesties, you know very well that Richard murdered the princes in the tower. But you know, again, nobody knew very well what had happened. So de Valera is interested in a, a an alliance between England and Spain. So he has his own little agenda going on there. And we've got John Rouse, who is a really good example of this flipping story. So I don't mean flipping story. I mean, the story being flipped. So he writes in 1486 uh, that the usurper King Richard III ascended the throne of the slaughtered children. And he's also the man who he's the only written source for Richard having uneven shoulders, which might sound like it makes him reliable. But he tucked this in with lots of detail about Richard being retained in his mother's womb for two years, born with a full set of sharp teeth, shoulder length hair, long fingernails and uneven shoulders. So it was kind of, that was kind of written off because it's in the middle of all of this other nonsense that he writes. But a couple of years earlier, when Richard was alive, Rouse couldn't sing his praises loudly enough. He was saying what an amazing, incredible person Richard was, which makes sense when he's the king, let's be honest. But, but in the immediate aftermath of Bosworth, Rouse kind of scurries around the countryside, collecting up all of these manuscripts that say Richard's amazing, rewrites his whole story in, in posh, fashionable Latin, saying that Richard is the most dreadful human being who ever lived. So I think he's a really good example of how you can see that story just turn almost on the day of, on the day of the Battle of Bosworth, the story turns and it's set. So there are people who talk, I mean, a good example of rumours spreading around comes from a guy called Robert Rickart, who is the recorder at Bristol. And he wrote in um, in a an, an entry for the year ending the 15th of September, 1483. So kind of the, the end of the summer of 1483. He wrote in this year, the two sons of King Edward were put to silence in the Tower of London. So he doesn't name Richard, but he there clearly are people in Bristol, you know, lots a long distance to the west of London, already saying that they think something might have happened to the princes in the Tower. But I would say that how is Robert Rickart getting that information? It's liable to be merchants and traders coming out of London. They're spreading gossip. You know, Bristol is a big trading port. They're carrying gossip. And if you go into tell a story, you're going to tell the most salacious version of the story possible. So, you know, people are saying the princes are dead. But it was no more than people were saying it. It was rumour. So I think you do have this kind of rumour spreading around in Richard's reign in England. Lots of early certainty on the continent, particularly in France, that Richard definitely has done it. And then after the Battle of Bosworth, you start to get a more and more confident body of evidence building up through Virgil and Moore and people like that through the 16th century, kind of embedding this story that Richard definitely murdered the princes in 1483, end of mystery. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you for that. I didn't I didn't really know uh, so much about the continental sources. And I think that it's a good thing to point out that, you know, sure, people were talking about this, but you have to think about the motivations behind why they might be talking about that. And obviously, it makes sense, especially if someone at the French court is spreading these rumors about the king, you know, across the sea it makes sense that they would want to paint Richard in as possibly bad of a light as they could to try and, like you said, kind of rally support against Richard, uh, whether that's, you know, for Henry the seventh or just simply for, um, maybe plans for a French invasion. So I think that's, that's really interesting. Thank you for that context. Um, and I would say that everything I've just said doesn't mean that Richard didn't murder the princes. <laughs> You know, I'm shooting holes in the French story and I'm suggesting that lots of this is rumour. But I don't know that Richard didn't murder the princes. I happen to believe he most likely didn't, but I can't prove that any more than I think anyone can prove to me that he did. So whilst I'm trying to shoot holes in the story here, none of what I've just said doesn't mean that Richard could have killed the princes. He definitely could have. Yeah, he, he could have, but I do think it's still, you know, it's important to have that context, especially when we're thinking about rumors. I think it's easy to think about the things that are said. I keep going back to Margaret just because in my opinion, um, it's just unlikely, uh, that, you know, that she had the means to somehow be involved, uh, in their disappearance. So I think it can be easy maybe to look at some of the rumors that people have been circulating now about Margaret and that, you know, of course she did it. And to say, um, you know, of course she 
she didn't, uh, in my opinion. But I do think for Richard, people, they take the rumors that have been circulating against him and they, they take them as fact, right? They take them as just being um, a 100% given that this is the truth, this is what actually happened. Instead of looking at maybe the root of those rumors, why those rumors were circulated, um, what they might say about the people who are circulating them or the places in which they're circulated. And I think that your, you know, your example of these rumors on the continent, I think that does a good job at showing why we need to think about these uh, rumors more holistically and not just taking them if they're, you know, lending themselves to what we want to believe about the disappearance of the princes, not necessarily taking them as being 100% historical reality and, and provable fact, because obviously people had their own motivations for saying the things that they said. So thank you. Thank you all uh, for, for talking about what these rumors were like at the time, for kind of setting the stage a little bit um, for the historical reality of these rumors. I know I know what I want to hear, and I think it's probably what listeners want to hear, and it is your takes uh, on the possibility of these three big historical players being involved in the disappearance of the princes. Okay, so I'm sorry to leave you all on a cliffhanger, but that is where we are going to end part one of this episode. But don't worry, part two is going to be out soon. So keep checking back and we'll continue exploring what might have happened to the princes in the tower. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 